Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us today, where we're going to talk about the decarbonization journey and the hard to abate sectors. Um, today, we are joined by Raj Narayan Nan, sorry, CMO of Ultratech, um, Chris Bataille, Adjunct Resilience Fellow at Columbia University, and Lucy Rodriguez, Executive Vice President of Investor Relations. Corporate Communications and Public Affairs at CMEX. So, reaching economy-wide zero is gonna take all of our resources and all of us working together. It's going to take um, resources like hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, solar, wind, and nuclear, especially in those, as I mentioned, those hard abate sectors in steel, cement, and chemical industries. Global challenges require global solutions, and optionality is not optional. That means we need to be able to leverage whatever we have that is available to us, both locally and regionally. So that is why EPRI is collaborating with the World Economic Forum and Accenture to create industrial clusters that can create local regional economies that can stimulate job creation and also decarbonize the, the region as well. So with that, we've got some questions for our panelists today. And we're going to start with, to what extent can emissions in your respective sectors be reduced by greening the grid and building out clean electricity generation capacity? So Lucy, why don't we start with you? Is that okay? How did I win that? Um, <laughs> well, I think um, as pretty much everyone in this room probably knows, um, for us, fuels are one of the large sources of emissions. They constitute about 40% of our total emissions. Um, process is even more. But to the extent that we can electrify and we can get temperatures as high as 1,500 degrees Celsius, which we need for the kilns themselves through electricity, and that's not easy, I think, again, as more people in this room know better than I do, um, we could at least substitute that fuel and you know we are we are already substituting with alternatives but we could substitute the fossil fuel with electricity and bring a pretty significant reduction overall and then on the process emission side it brings some benefits in that we would have a very pure emission of, of carbon without having any of the fossil fuels in the emissions which would allow easier carbon capture for those fuels. So I think that those are probably two very important areas for us. The challenge still is getting the electrification up to a high enough temperature. Thank you. So um, would you like to go next? Sure. And shall I speak directly to steel, I suppose, uh, since, yes. we, since we've done cement? Um, clean of electrification is going to be absolutely critical to decarbonizing the steel sector. Um, about 25% of steel today is done recycled through electric arc furnaces, just cleaning up that electricity because those uh, the electric arc furnaces use about 500 megawatts per ton, you know, ideally down to about 300, 400, what have you. Cleaning those up takes them for about 600, uh, you know, kilograms of CO2 per ton steel down. We could take it as, as low as 50. Now, that's the recycled steel, which could maybe double by 2050. It's the primary steel, the 70, 75 percent of steel making today, which is done with coal. To the extent we could electrify that um, cheaply um, is sort of the big turning point. So we have one key technology, direct reduced iron technology, which requires, today we use a syngas of hydrogen and carbon monoxide to do the reduction. Um, if we could go all hydrogen um, and clean electrolysis based hydrogen, you could have virtually zero GHG, zero GHG steel. And then there's another, that's more expensive, and then there's an, a coming generation of steel reduction technologies based on electrolysis that might hit the market about 2035, 2040. Um, th to the extent we have enough of clean electricity to run those, it, we're utterly, yeah, clean electricity is critical to carbonizing steel. Okay, thank you, Chris. Raj? So uh, coming from uh, cement sector, the hard to abate sector, we have uh, many opportunities, of course, to reduce emissions. I would uh, classify uh, five major uh, you know, priorities uh, for us, opportunities for us. One is obviously we have a uh, lot of opportunities in energy. 
Energy is uh, the major component of any cement making. So we have uh, almost um, 65 to 70 percent um, as uh, energy in our um, manufacturing systems. So first is um, on the energy efficiency, I would say how do you improve your efficiency better and better? In the last 10, 15 years uh, as cement sector, we have uh, improved more than 6 to 7 percent uh, purely on the technical efficiencies. The other part uh, is obviously about the renewables we have. Um, how do we uh, get um, less carbon footprint through renewables? Cement, uh, as uh, she said, that two thirds is, uh, would be in um, the process and one third is in the uh, electricity part of it. So on the power you have uh, uh, renewables at this point of time, we, we have um, uh, 16, 17 hours of uh, you know, power still we don't have the battery storage uh, at scale economically and we don't have this uh, pump storage economically so the the other part is on the process emissions we still have to go a long way that's on energy and um, uh, the second is a material circularity so we have uh, the raw materials waste materials coming from the other sector which can be used as raw material into uh, our sector. For example, you have uh, the slag from steel sector, we have fly ash from power sector. Uh, so these are all, uh, and of course, uh, red mud from aluminum sector, all these can be used as a raw material. So waste from other sector can be used as raw materials. And uh, the alternative uh, fuels, you know, so we can use anything with calorific value. So it's um, the municipal uh, solid waste or the plastic waste or the chemical waste, anything we can use in our system. The third one I would uh, also talk about is the green product. So the sector, cement sector, continuously working on uh, greener products that would uh, reduce the carbon footprint and that will also reduce the water content, water consumption uh, ultimately. So that's been uh, continuously uh, used. The fourth lever is about the technology part of it. So um, you, you have process emissions which would be very difficult to control. So, Either you have the electrification uh, so that the, the thermal requirement uh, comes down or you emit CO2 and ultimately capture it. You know, you have the carbon capture uh, technologies, etc. There are many, many more technologies, but these are very important technologies as well. And the last one obviously is about the policy front. You know, see the carbon market ultimately would lead to the incentives part of it and then also incentivize people to go ahead and make those investments. So I would say these are the five broad levers uh, which would help us um, to reduce the emissions uh, in the uh, cement sector particularly. Okay, thank you. I heard that um, some of these pillars that we often talk about, even with trying to green the electricity grid, where we talk about efficiency in the processes, carbon capture at the, um, at the end of the product, and, and then also using clean resources to start. So those are levers, which I think is a very good way to put it because it's, it's a way to like, which ones do you turn the knob on to and then how you prioritize your processes. So thank you. So let's think about China. So it's by far the world's largest consumer and producer of steel, cement, and aluminum. However, the materials intensive Chinese property sector is facing setbacks and many economists believe that the Chinese market will increasingly face headwinds over the medium and long term. So what are the implications of a potential reduction in Chinese demand for your sectors and how could that impact decarbonization pathways? Lucy, would you like to go ahead? Sure. Um, our operations are probably the ones that are furthest from China here, but at any rate, um, you know, number one, I think we've already seen a downturn in demand in terms of Chinese demand for cement. I mean, China for a number of years now has been an important importer. That changed, I think, a year and a half ago. So we are seeing that decline. Um, and, uh, you know, on the, for us in terms of operations, cement is very local. So there is a, a small threat probably on the import market side in places like the United States. China at one point in time was a large importer to the US and then that stopped. But I, I think that the bigger impact is probably in more um, on the decarbonization front as we go forward. I believe we have already started seeing some carbon capture in China and I think that if the Chinese government puts its heft behind it, it should accelerate the development of CCUS and we really do need the cost curve on CCUS to come down. So. 
Okay. Chris? Yeah, so what's interesting is that over the last 20 years, China's taken several hundred million people from, po from poverty level up to middle class, middle class level. It's one of the fastest rises in human welfare in history. But along with that came a tremendous amount of concrete, a tremendous amount of steel, and they built the world's largest blast furnace fleet. It's 54% of, 54 of global steel production. Now, as, the global, as their real estate market starts to slow down, they, don't, they stop building metros, they don't need to build more infrastructure, there's a lot of very modern blast Blast furnace is sitting there, you know, what do we do next? And their production was largely, it's not a strictly market-driven economy where, you know, there are certain allocations that go out to given regions, you build this much supply, and they tend to, over the last 20 years, have tend to structurally build about 5% too much steel compared to their own needs, which has led to this great large global excess capacity and a, and a dropping in steel prices, which has forced global, uh, steel, Western steel makers to retreat into specialty steels to kind of to keep themselves alive. Now what happens now though is that as Chinese fundamental demand for iron products recedes, there's a lot of blast furnaces looking for something to do. Now if China chooses to mothball the least efficient and least GA, the highest GHG intensity ones, you won't see as big of an impact. But if those blast furnaces are allowed to just keep on producing steel, you're going to see a tremendous amount of steel that ends up as vehicles exported or ends up as structural steel products exported and there will be a big drop. That, and that's going to be literally a policy choice um, of the Chinese government. Okay, very interesting. Raj, how about your sector? Yeah, from our perspective, we don't have uh, operations in China in cement, uh, so I, I'm not sure about this uh, impact. I'm not an economist, but I do feel that the uh, fuel would uh, have a major impact in the sense that the prices might go down if the consumption of uh, fuel comes down in China. That's one. The second, the possibility is also about, uh, we use a lot of cement in, uh, uh, steel in cement industry. So it will be worthwhile to watch whether the, the surplus capacities or capacities available uh, in uh, China, would it uh, help uh, the steel prices to cool off a bit and then we can, whether we can uh, benefit some uh, on the slight lower commodity prices. So. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, so let's think about in each of your sectors, each is different and will require diverse technologies for deep decarbonization. Could each of you please elaborate on these deep decarbonization technologies, such as hydrogen or carbon capture, which you've already been touching on a little bit, and explain how they fit into your decarbonization strategy? Shall we mix it up a little bit this time? Chris, would you like to go first? Sure, absolutely. Um, the first, okay, so when you're looking at heavy industry, the very first thing you need to look, like, look at is design. Um, we use a lot of steel and concrete, probably about 20% more than we absolutely need to get the job done. And there's a cost to design. There's a cost to you know, designing out that upfront need and going to hire products and thinking a little bit more carefully about it. So we need to incentivize you know, design that just uses less of the material. And California has built 2446, which is going to require 40% less embodied car carbon in buildings. That could end up translated at the US level. Uh, several European countries have something similar to it. So the first thing is just design. Second is material efficiency or material switching. Can we switch out, can you switch the steel out for other materials that are less GHG intense? Um, the, um, the third thing is just more recycling. We're at 25% secondary production of steel today, which is made with electricity, which is, de which is decarbonizable. Um, the amount of scrap that's coming online, and specifically in Asian countries and specifically in China, could take us up to 50% recycled steel um, by, t by 2050. Um, it's just it's less energy intense, it's less GHG intense. The thing is to do a lot of recycling, however, you need high quality scrap. And in the past, we've tend to have just, you know, we take a car and we put it into a shredder and we're not careful about getting out all the copper wiring, the chrome and everything else. You, we need to A, get all the, the copper is the key thing you have to get out of, out, out of stuff because it contaminates the, the scrap. But then we need to design stuff so that it's easy to get out and you can rip all the copper out in 15 minutes before the car ends up in a scrapper. And that provides you with a much higher quality product for 
for, for melting and then making into higher quality products, including other vehicles. Currently, we take high quality thin sheet steel for vehicles and then we, oh, what comes out the back is low quality rebar for construction. Uh, but we can do a whole lot better and there are companies like Nucor, CMC, what have you, that are doing that. Final step is decarbonizing the reduction of iron, which is the separation of oxygen from, oxygen, um, from iron in iron ore. Um, today we do it with blast furnaces. They're incredible machines. They're a miracle of thermodynamics, but they, they emit an incredible amount of CO2. Um, there's one step away from blast for, um, we could ho hope to put CCS on them. No one's doing the work to do that, however. 95% capture CCS on a blast furnace. The, the first best thing is to go to direct reduction, uh, direct, d direct reduction furnaces, which potentially you can do 95% capture CCS on because they're starting with methane and uh, CO a carbon monoxide comes out as eventually as CO2. But eventually you want to go to fully decarbonized reduced iron. And that means 100% um, you know, capture on a DRI unit or elect electrolysis-based hydrogen going into the DRI unit. Um, and eventually, eventually, say, electrolysis or what have you. And there's a couple of diff different options for doing that. But it's, a bit, it's sort of a three-step process there. And the costs kind of do that, do something like this for each of those steps. OK. Thank you. So Lucy, would you like to go next? <laughs> OK. Um, we think about the world a little bit from the technologies and the levers that we have today, which at least now through 2030, um, we've been extremely successful so far in deploying these. In the last three years, we actually have decarbonized at a rate of about 12%, which in the prior, say, that would have typically taken us about 15 years to reach that same level of decarbonization. And this is doing things, reducing clinker factor, using alternative fuels, improving energy efficiency. But once we reach 2030, we still have some ways to go with those existing levers, but we do need some new technology. And you know, some of the things, certainly design is a big piece of it. Customer demand is also going to be very important because without moving the lever so that customers themselves are comfortable with lower carbon concrete, um, that's going to be essential. And a large part of that gets back to government regulation <laughs> because in places like the United States, we have recipe-based building codes with extremely high clinker factors that are required. Um, so a lot has to change on the regulatory framework. We do, in our roadmap, rely on carbon capture for you know, 30 to 35 percent to get us to net zero by, 20, you know, by 2050. Um, and there's a long way to go there. Currently, it is not profitable, even with very ample government support in Europe and in the United States. So we have to see that cost curve go down before you're going to see private companies really coming in in a big way and investing in that. Um, we also are looking at things like micronization, and um, we're using hydrogen today, but more to boost alternative fuel usage. I'm not sure we're going to get to the point where we can actually fully substitute hydrogen. So, okay. Yes, we've got some challenges ahead, especially yes. with carb capture and looking at those cost curves. Raj? Yeah, so I would uh, broadly divide them into three categories. Uh, one is um, on what we can do with the power situation, with the technologies we know. That's where I talked about the renewables. The only problem with the renewables today is uh, we can only do about 60 to 70 percent. Cement is a continuous uh, running operation, so you, can't, you need power for 24 hours round the clock. So if you have power for 16, 17 hours, what do you do? You, do you still run this uh, thermal power plant or buy it from the uh, grid? So that's where the, the uh, newer technologies will help. You know, for example, the renewables uh, for 24 hours can happen through battery storage. It can happen through uh, pump storage. And we also now uh, know about the salt storage solutions, you know, where the heat is uh, absorbed in the salt and then it actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, releases the energy. So these are some of the possibilities for the power section. But the second important priority for us is uh, how do we manage this uh, process emissions. That's going to be very difficult because, you know, we have um, uh, the temperatures going up to 14 deg uh, 1400 degrees centigrade. So our fuel consumption is uh, two thirds will be on the process side and one third on uh, on one third on the power. 
even assuming that two thirds we are able to manage uh, through uh, some technology that will significantly reduce. We are obviously the cement sector is uh, looking into the electrification uh, for the deep deep uh, deep carbonization decarbonization. The the uh, the concept is uh, how do you convert the electrical energy to thermal energy to create that kind of uh, temperature. Uh, so that's one of the most interesting technologies that's being worked uh, uh, today. Obviously, we will not see something in the next couple of years. It will take some more time because at scale, at uh, whether we will be able to do it economically, that's going to be a very important question. The third one is uh, the cement produces CO2 uh, through process. You know, you can't, unless you change the raw material for cement, this will not go off. So the only way to uh, do is, uh, obviously, you have this cementitious material. So you add fly ash and slag, etc., and other material to reduce your uh, CO2 footprint. But there is a limit to which you can do. And uh, it also has an impact on your strength. So we need to work on carbon capture technologies. So uh, it's not carbon capture alone is uh, enough. You know, you have to carbon capture and utilization, and then whether you'll be able to sell that product, um, you know, on a commercial scale, that needs to be watched. The other question you asked about hydrogen. Hydrogen, as of now, cannot be used as fuel in uh, the process, as of now. But uh, it can be used in alternative fuel. When you use alternative fuel, your hydrogen can be used. But today, hydrogen uh, is, uh, is not at a level which can be used uh, economically again. So we are looking into hydrogen coming down to $1, $1.5 in the next decade or so per kg, which will help us to use hydrogen for improving our alternative uh, materials, alternative fuels, which in turn will reduce your fossil fuel consumption. Thank you. So I'm hearing that you know when we're talking about energy, it's the thermal properties, the heat that is a big barrier and not just the power requirements that are necessary. Thank you. So um, let's talk about, um, we've talked a lot about production and consumption, but let's focus on transmission and the midstream sector. How significant a challenge is connecting clean energy production and demand for each of your sectors. Who would like to go first, Raj? Yeah, as I just said, uh, the clean energy usage is quite difficult in the cement sector because it's, we are a, a continuous running operations round the clock power. The technologies are not available for the continuous power at this point of time. So we have to develop this uh, battery storage. Uh, we have to develop this pump storage. We have to develop uh, the solutions where the heat can be stored during that six to seven hours. So at this point of time, we have hybrid power. We can work for 16, 17 hours, uh, which is commercially viable today. Beyond that, um, it's going to be difficult. I, I'm speaking for India. So it's going to be beyond that 16, 17 hours. How do we manage the, uh, the power? That's going to be a big question mark and, and the clean energy. So that's where we are. number of uh, technologies are being worked on, like uh, renewable, um, the solar concentration, the electrification, etc. A lot of things are being worked on at this point, and that's a little difficult uh, 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 to do it right now. So I I see a visibility that it will be cracked in the next uh, you know five to six years, but this is a transition phase, you know. So we have to work on that. Okay, thank you, Chris. Would you like to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, if you're going to fully electrify steel, you're going to add a lot of electro electrical load to the grid. Um, industry already eats about a third of the electricity that's made, and you're probably looking at more than a doubling, uh, doubling of that. Now, the hybrid project in Sweden, the way they get around this is what they do is when there's lot, when there's cheap power available, be it from so uh, hydro or be it from wind, they buy up the power and make make hydrogen, then they store it underground. And the idea is you build a large enough cavern that it can take you through periods when electrical prices are really high. So that's one way of kind of coping with management with the grid. It also gives you some demand response flexibility for help for helping uh, helping the grid. But I think if we're going to do a lot of steel this way, you're going to have to think about islanded power grids, right? So you're out in the U.S. Southwest or, the, or, or Western South Africa or in Brazil. You build your own gigawatt of solar. You make your electricity. You turn it into hydrogen. You store it underground. 
And you've got nominal connection to the grid. You can help with grid support and what have you, but you've got most of your own. And that way, you, you're effectively your own IPP. You control your electricity <laughs> prices. So if we're really going to do a lot of this, we're going to probably have to build a lot of new dedicated power for these facilities. Okay, thank you. Lucy, what are your thoughts? Um, I think the one thing I would just echo is that even in the cement sector, if we start moving into carbon capture, our electricity needs are also going to double. And so we get back to kind of what this, what the COP's all about, which is you, you were doing a pretty good job increasing renewable energy, but then you've got transmission and you have demand even rising um, as well. So I, I think that our concern is more, is the world prepared for this huge increase that we expect in terms of electricity and can they actually deliver? We're on the grid in most markets um, and we're pretty much dependent on our electricity providers. So, Yeah, so they're really going to have to step it up because in addition to your industries, I think uh, we predict that it might be four times the amount by 2050. So there's a lot of work to be done, a lot of investment. Okay. So let's think about the lowest hanging fruit. So what is the lowest hanging fruit in each of your sectors from a decarbonization perspective? What do you wish governments and other stakeholders were taking a closer look at? And I know you had mentioned policymakers, but governments do have an important role. So. Lucy, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, you know, on the regulatory side in particular, it is obviously very country specific. And, you know, we operate in, uh, in 40 countries around the world. What we find is that we can decarbonize using our existing levers in places like Europe to a very large extent. Um, you know, we've reduced our, Europe is what leads, we've reduced our carbon there in excess of 45% um, in the last three years. We're reaching alternative fuels that are in excess of 70%. Some plants are running 90% area. But it's because you have a regulatory environment that promotes a circular and a green economy. We're able to get alternative fuels that we can use to substitute for fossil fuels. Um, I hate to pick on my own country, but when you move to places like the United States, where there really are not very large landfill tax, we do not have any type of free market carbon, uh, you know, a carbon market in place that we think could really drive change. Um, and we also have the building codes that I already referred to. Um, a very large part of our ability to decarbonize for this sector is really in the regulatory area. And advocacy, advocacy is probably what can move the needle the most for us over the next five years. So, great. Thank you, Raj. Would you like to go next? So the low-hanging fruit is obviously on the energy and technologies where we know. So um, as I'm just uh, following up what she, you said, um, how do we get to the round-the-clock power? How do you get to the alternative fuel, etc.? Or uh, immediately we can get a lot of benefits. But I would uh, particularly talk about India. So India, we have close to about um, 700 million tons of waste generated uh, per annum out of which about 500 million tons would be on this uh, biomass and agricultural waste. The balance 300 million tons, only about 13-14% is being used today in the, uh, usefully in any of the energy sectors. So we have to scale up from the 13% to at least 65-70% uh, to have a meaningful contribution in cement. So that's where it's about uh, the collection, segregation, and also incentives offered at different places would be extremely important uh, for us to go, go forward. When we talk about renewables, um, while it is a low-hanging fruit, but it requires a lot of land, and our land requirement is going to significantly go up for all the energy needs we have, power needs we have, uh, rough estimate is somewhere between seven to eight times from where we are today is the land requirement as we go forward. So that's going to be a challenge that while that's, uh, that's a low hanging fruit, but that's going to be a challenge. But uh, the, the second part of your question is about what uh, governments can do on the policies. I can, um, while a lot of people have asked for uh, some specific po policy changes on incentives, etc., I would call for two things. One, if the governments are able to um, uh, uh, mandate the users to use certain percentage of product as green product, then it will also significantly help 
today green products is, uh, would be slightly more expensive than the normal product, right? So how do you um, make it uh, commercially uh, at a commercial scale and then still be able to sell? A certain percentage of green products that will help. The second is about the raw materials like you know the slag and uh, the fly ash. If the governments also you know mandate that these would be allocated to high carbon intensity sector. So that is the, the best possible opportunity to reduce the carbon <laughs> footprint as a country. So these would be my two ask uh, on a policy level with the government. Okay, thanks Raj. Chris, what would be low hanging fruit for you? Oh, there's all sorts of low hanging fruit in steel. <laughs> Um, the, the thing is, we currently just don't value GHG intensity in steel grades, but we had secondary, primary, what have you. Um, the GHG intensity of steel can go anywhere from zero through, you know, 500 kilograms to a ton, all the way up to four tons per ton, and there's just zero valuation on that whatsoever. Uh, and if I had a magic wand, yes, I'd bring a carbon price or something into being with border carbon adjustments, but that's simply not going to happen. Um, so we need to activate that. We need to activate that somehow. Backing up a bit, speaking to Raj's point, renewable power eats a lot of land, right? So we have to think about can we move the making of the renewable power where there is land and high quality sun, high quality wind, what have you. You do the process making of hydrogen or electrolytic processing there, then you move the intermediate product to where it's needed for final processing. So in the, U you know, you could make reduced iron in South Africa, put it on a boat, send it to Hamburg and it goes into an electric arc furnace. Or you make reduced iron in the western US in the, in the desert and then send it up to Michigan where it gets made in steel. And we need to let the market do these kinds of things because they're possible, but there's just not incentivized whatsoever, whatsoever at this point in time. Um, a key thing is just cleaning, keeping, separating our scrap. Like stop wasting our scraps, sort it out carefully, get the copper out. Iron is infinitely recyclable if you get the contaminants out. So just putting, putting that in place would help a lot. Um, a, a production tax credit in, in the U.S. case for re clean reduced iron, a really high one for zero, you know, a marginally you know, half of that for something else, something like that would go a really long way. And there would be different equivalents in different, different economies. Okay, thank you. So we're going to move into um, individual questions, and we'll just start with you, Raj. And Kristen and Lucy. So Raj, decarbonization of hard to abate sectors takes an all of the above approach. There's no single solution. So could you elaborate on some of the steps Ultratech is taking to reduce emissions? What are the challenges the sector may face during the transition? And what are the critical enablers that would accelerate the decarbonization in the cement sector? Yeah, so uh, the first part of it, as I said earlier, uh, we have the renewables for power, renewables for uh, the energy needs for the process, and then the technology requirements uh, for uh, your, um, uh, your process emissions, so which uh, we talked about earlier. But the second part of it is about uh, the challenges. The, the, uh, the, as I said, the energy needs, even if uh, they come from the alternative fuels, uh, in India, at least, you know, we have to go a long way in collecting them, segregating them, and getting the right quality uh, product. And we don't have any specific uh, things on uh, chemical waste, uh, the movement, etc. There is also a, a bit of a problem which we are working on with uh, the uh, suppliers, etc. The, um, of course, land is a big issue for us, you know, the, uh, on the renewable uh, story, you know, it's a very big issue. The second part of it is uh, the critical thing is about uh, the raw materials, the, the uh, be it uh, fly ash or uh, slag or even uh, the red mud, etc., would be a big problem, especially the first two. When you are talking about reducing your coal power, it's going to be a bigger and bigger issue. When a reduction of coal power, so you'll have red, uh, reduction in the fly ash availability as well. So when we go forward, we do think that there will be a huge scarcity. And when you're talking about green cement, we will not have it, uh, you know, 10 years or 15 years uh, from, the, uh, from now. So while the cement is moving up in demand, the availability of these products uh, will keep coming down. That's going to be a very big uh, challenge uh, for that. The third challenge I would also talk about is the investment part of it. The investment in all the three parts of it I am talking about, the, the power, the process energy, as well as the, uh, the carbon capture. The requirements are pretty huge and uh, we are talking about a scale of 40-50 times where, from where we are today. 
Now, if you invest so much, uh, how do you take back that money? Um, you know, uh, that's going to be a big problem. Investment is uh, really an issue. The last one I would also talk about is on the, uh, the just transition. When you have so much of coal coming down, say let's take in the next uh, decade or two, the, the so much of uh, manpower, so many of uh, them uh, would be made redundant and what do we do? And that just transition is also something which we need to look at and that's also going to be a major challenge. Okay, thank you. So Chris, the majority of GHG emissions from primary production of steel derived from electricity what are some of the ways that we can reduce grid emissions? Specifically, what role do you anticipate steel um, reductions playing, playing in the wind sector? In the wind sector? In the wind sector. Maybe that's not the right question <laughs> for you, I think. So um, how about, um, let's talk about, um, wow, some, some if additional thoughts that you might have in reducing the electricity consumption for steel. Oh, reducing the, I don't think, I, I think we have to flip this on its head. We're going to have to be as efficient as possible. But we're going to have to electrify as much of steel making as possible. But that means we're going to have to think very broadly about trade, about internet supply chains. You know, today, you know, we're still operating with an 1880s model of making steel. You take coal and iron ore to the place where you want to make steel, and then, and then out it pops. Whereas, I think we should be reducing iron ore where the ore is and where high quality and renewable electricity is. And then, then you make a transportable HB, um, hot briquetted iron. You just compress the iron, you put it on a boat, and then you send it to where the steel's made. Iron is iron. Elemental iron is, it, you know, there are a thousand, maybe 10,000 different grades of steel. There's one type of iron, right, which could become, you know, a global commodity with a metals exchange in London or perhaps Mumbai or what, what have you. Uh, it's something, it's something along those lines. We need to think differently about where the electricity consumption is going to be. And having diverse, we don't want to go from one model of dependence to another. You need at least five different suppliers of this reduced iron feeding into a common market so no one feels exposed if they get cut off from one supplier or another, like, such as what happened you know, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Oh, uh, so I left out your question on enablers, so, so I thought I would answer before you pick up the microphone. So, <laughs> so I, I would think the collaboration is going to be the key uh, in, in the sector as we go for um, the net zero aspirations. The sector specific, um, uh, while we talked about sector specific priorities, Across the sectors also, we have to see how we can cooperate, you know, so we talked about the raw materials, uh, one industry's waste uh, would be used in other industries. So the sectoral collaboration is very important. Then the government to government collaboration is also very important because we talked about a lot of technologies and these technologies are developed by different countries at uh, uh, different maturity levels. How do we get these technologies uh, to uh, meaningfully operate and reduce the carbon footprint? So government to government collaboration is also very, very uh, important. I also talk about the collaboration with uh, the global platforms, uh, global associations, uh, research bodies, etc. Uh, for example, in, in, in our sector, we have mission, possi mission possible partnerships, uh, we have the GCCA. So all these would help you to uh, you know, also uh, reduce. Uh, the carbon footprint. And the last one also about the digitalization and AI, etc., how we can very effectively use it. So the collaboration across the sectors and collaboration across the technology providers. I do feel the technology for any of the sectors, uh, and I can speak for my sector, cement, would no more uh, only come from the, uh, the uh, traditional technology providers the technology will come from the startup ecosystem and uh, will come from people who are not related to the particular sector. And that's where the, it's critical to pick up uh, those and absorb into your system. So, so these are some of the uh, critical enablers, uh, in particular for cement industry, I would say. Yeah, we have to look for innovation wherever we can find it. Okay, so Lucy, um, carbon... <laughs> so carbon capture and storage is going to be required for deep decarbonization in the cement sector, but CCS is a nascent technology. So what is the cement sector doing to lower the cost curve for CCS? 
Um, you know, we do have, as I mentioned already, we do have government financing in place in, in Europe and in the United States. And so a lot of it's coming from the countries. You have, you know, the first carbon capture will come online for our industry next year. It's in Norway, and um, the Norwegian government is providing probably close to about 80% of the financing of that. So extremely expensive. Um, I think it is difficult, as we've already mentioned, about it's simply not profitable today unless you have a tremendous amount of government support. With what has been rolled out in the United States and in Europe, it's still very iffy to make it profitable. Um, however, I think from our view, it is important that there be some flagship carbon capture. Um, there, we don't believe that the technology as it develops will be proprietary. We're working quite a bit with other industries and with startups. Um, Semex actually has its own VC unit, as well as we have an open innovation platform um, to try to bring some of that technology that's further ahead in the power area, of even to in oil and gas, into the cement sector. But it is important to have that cement view because the challenges are different as you try to adapt that technology. Um, but government financing is absolutely critical, and in a large part of the world, it's not going to be available. Um, you know, I can tell you, as we think about carbon capture, we're looking at Europe, we're looking at the United States. Our home country, Mexico, it's, it's, we simply can't make the numbers work today. So we do need to see that reduction in cost, and then maybe you'll start seeing this roll out to all cement operations. But we're a long way away from that currently. Yeah, thank you for that. I kind of find it funny you said that the power sector might be ahead, but I think there may be one carbon capture in the entire world right now that's going. One more than ours. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, <laughs> one more than yours. So. so I think there's some things that we have in common that when we think of innovation where we need it to come from many places, but we can definitely have it come from each other because carbon capture is a common theme that I heard. It's not the only thing that all of us can need, but we have different levers that we can all use. And so as we keep working together and share what we learn, perhaps we can learn um, not just what works best for us, but some pitfalls that we can avoid so that we can move faster into the future. So I very much want to thank our panelists today. I believe we are about out of time. And so uh, please give a hand to our panelists here today. Thank you.